Good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for coming uh, today. Uh, for me, watching this inspiring video, it's, it's very clear to me that no one captures what Geisel School of Medicine in Dartmouth is about, or the state of our medical school, for that matter, than our remarkable students. Uh, and I think, uh, in a very real sense, we're all here uh, because of the students. I want to welcome our students, our residents, fellows, faculty, staff, and alumni to the 2012 State of the Medical School. Thank you for being here, and thank you for all you do to make this a great medical school. Uh, from my perspective, there's never been a more exciting time to be here, and I uh, want to talk a little bit today about uh, some of the things that we're up to. First of all, we're building a strong team. We're attracting an excellent, more diverse class of medical students. Top researchers from around the nation are coming to Geisel. The Dartmouth College Board of Trustees, the college leadership, and the Board of Overseers of the Medical School all clearly support our 2020 plan and the roadmap that we've outlined for growth and excellence. And finally, we're working closer and better with uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock, with the VA, and many other partners. While we, like every organization, has our own set of challenges and uh, difficulties that we must work hard to tackle, I'm uh, very proud to say today that uh, the state of the Geisel School of Medicine is strong. We're accumulating the leadership capacity to accomplish our goals, and we're beginning to tell that story around the, the country. Today, I'd like to review with you our 2020 plan, its overarching goals and key strategies, and our progress to date. I'm also looking forward to recognizing some of our students, our faculty and staff who embody the values of Geisel uh, every day and step up to the plate helping us to uh, accomplish our mission of improving lives. I'll save the very best for last as we introduce and celebrate the inaugural class of our master faculty educators at the Geisel uh, School of Medicine. So, uh, as you know, our 2020 vision is uh, anchored in three overarching goals. Uh, number one, we're committed to uh, national leadership in medical education and pedagogical uh, innovations. Um, the innovation part of this goal is critical. Uh, yes, we want to be great teachers, but we want to be on the cutting edge of new technologies and new uh, models of education. Second, it is uh, critical that the research that we conduct be impactful and that it be distinctive, that it advance science and science's applications. And finally, uh, we want to be the paradigm for tackling healthcare's most pressing and problematic challenges, of which there are too many uh, to name. Now, inside of these three arching goals, we've got five key strategies. Uh, number one is reform of the medical school curriculum. As you know, the curriculum reform task force has been at work for a good eight months now. Part of their uh, task is to uh, make recommendations about a four-year dual degree. We want to increase our research funding to at least $180 million. I'd like to think it's going to be $200 million. And in the process, we're going to recruit 75 to 100 new researchers. We want to align our partnership with the hospital and uh, fully integrate research and education across the continuum, integrate delivery science across uh, Dartmouth in the process. It's important that we increase our reputational scores, uh, and in the, at the same time, we want to increase our endowment by 50% so that we can have a sustainable future. And finally, uh, in the midst of all this, uh, disciplined fiscal and operational accountability uh, is going to be key. So let me uh, start with goal number one, which is our aspiration to be national leaders in, uh, in medical education. Um, we have new leadership, which will uh, help us achieve this goal. Dr. Rich Simons uh, has been here a total of, uh, of four days and is our new uh, senior associate dean for medical education and also serves as our uh, one of our associate vice president for health affairs. Um, Rich and his wife Kathy are here, and I'm so delighted that, you're, that you've joined us. Um, 
Tim Leahy has led the curriculum re redesign process now for a number of months, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge his contributions. We're going to be placing a significant emphasis on uh, developing teaching excellence and creating opportunities for both our faculty and our residents to, uh, to become better teachers. I'll talk a little bit about the new, new facilities that will um, make that possible. And one of the things Dr. Simons and I have been talking about is how we organize this and uh, we'll be establishing an Office of Faculty Advance, Advancement in Teaching. Uh, we've asked Leslie Fall to take the lead in that. This is Leslie's project as part of her uh, year at uh, ELAM. Um, today we'll be introducing you to our inaugural group of faculty master educators. I anticipate this cohort getting up to 80, maybe 100 people but today we're going to introduce the first uh, 16. Um, uh, Dr. Simons is, uh, is intent on building an instructional design team. We'll be recruiting a PhD in education uh, to lead that effort. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Office of Research Mentoring, which uh, we're putting together. Uh, and then finally, um, our new Center for Information Resources, which will be located in what you know is the new Gilman Dana, um, and what has historically been called the library is going to be critical to um, our success. Why curricular reform? Well, it's very clear that uh, we have a need for uh, more longitudinal experiences for our students, more integration of the basic sciences and the clinical sciences, more active learning, uh, opportunities, more team-based learning, and more effective use of technology. This uh, article, which appeared in the New York Times a couple of months ago, uh, really highlights how medical education is, is changing, and we need to be right at the front uh, end of that. Uh, we've got a website uh, up and available on curricular reform. Uh, I think there's been at least 100 people who have been working uh, diligently on this. Let me just acknowledge a few of them who have given uh, their time uh, so generously. And uh, there's another uh, uh, six or seven dozen who are uh, equally contributing. I will say we've had seven or eight medical students who have been continuously involved in this effort who have been just invaluable in pointing out to us uh, how to do this uh, uh, right. The foundational pillars, um, I think, are outlined here. We, we must have academic rigor, rigor and excellence. We must have diverse learning co contexts for our students, whether it's uh, in a foreign country or in, in uh, northern Minnesota uh, or right here in, in Hanover. We must have access to the very best scholars. I think this, for me, is one of the most distinctive things about Dartmouth is the access that our students have to the best and the brightest. Um, we're committed to creating a supportive learning community for our students, and of course, uh, it's critical that they have opportunities for leadership and personal growth. Tim Leahy reminded me that uh, it was time to allocate resources, and uh, we've... Uh, We've, we've already done some of that, but uh, Dr. Simons and I will be meeting with, uh, with uh, the team and moving forward very quickly with goal prioritization, allocation of resources. One of the things that is critical is broad-based faculty involvement. We've had involvement of a number of faculty, but now it's time to reach out through into the organization deep and wide and get everybody uh, to, to weigh in. And, uh, I promise you we will communicate regularly about uh, uh, what we're up to. This is no small task, and uh, all of you need to own it. The uh, North Campus Academic Center, which is the name that we're using uh, today uh, uh, for the replacement of Gilman uh, Dana, is, uh, is moving along quite well. I anticipate that the Board of Trustees will approve this project in its near finality uh, this weekend. Uh, this is the architect's mock-up of what that will uh, look like. We think it's a very attractive building with a 
brightly look lit form in the center, a uh, garden on the roof on the right. If you cut this thing uh, uh, horiz uh, in, in a cross section, this is more or less uh, the way the occupancy is going to look with uh, a fair amount of light blue there for the uh, TDI, TDC, and uh, medical school administration. A really exciting three-floor library that will be uh, wired to the max. Um, uh, a forum space which will uh, entertain uh, large conversations and, and discussions. And we've got some space there on the right in the purple for social sciences. Um, probably departments like anthropology and sociology, which will complement the growing emphasis on incorporating social sciences into uh, medicine. I promise you that there's many, many classrooms uh, in this building that will uh, serve the medical school very well, including two very, very large uh, uh, classrooms. And uh, uh, although this does not display it adequately, the interactivity and the connectivity between students and faculty, uh, I think this will be the building that will emblematize that uh, of all buildings on our, on our campus. The uh, diagram on your, on your left is a, uh, uh, a picture, if you will, of the, the floor right below grade. You can see there in the pink, that's the bottom floor of the library. There's this large um, uh, forum area here for um, uh, conversations, for um, lectures, for interactivity. And yes, we will have food service, and it will be more than just machines. Uh, in fact, we anticipate that this will be the go-to place in the northern part of the campus for good food and for people to, uh, to congregate and... Uh, and share ideas. The forum uh, is, uh, I think, very exciting. This is uh, uh, what the one at Stanford looks like. Ours will be different, but you can see that it's a very different kind of arrangement for encouraging people to, uh, to interact and, uh, and communicate. This uh, outdoor space here, I think, is, is quite interesting, um, probably depicted best in the next slide here. Uh, as this open um, quadrangle uh, communicating uh, to the uh, second floor just below grade. That fully communicates to Remsen on the second floor. And of course, at grade, you can uh, access the third floor of Remsen. So this now creates a configuration where the North Academic Medical Center is connected to Remsen, is connected to Vail, is connected to the Life Science Building to begin to give a, a feel for a North Campus biomedical quadrangle, uh, if you will. And then finally, uh, looking at the building uh, from the Life Sciences building, you can see uh, Old Main uh, directly ahead, Remsen on the right, and the uh, new facility on the left. Uh, this is uh, well, well, well ahead or moving along quite well in terms of schematic design, exactly what the skin of the building is going to look like, we're not entirely sure. But uh, this is a $115 million project, which um, is going to, uh, I think, get the green light um, on, uh, on Saturday. Number two is distinctive, impactful research and discovery. Um, I think the work that we're doing already is outstanding, but we need to grow. And the plan is to recruit at least 75 new researchers with a programmatic emphasis over the next uh, six to eight years. Uh, we clearly want to build clinical and translational research. The partnership with uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock is critical to do this. Um, one of the things that uh, perhaps we have not talked about as much in the past is the growth of our graduate students. And we're going to grow our graduate students somewhere around 100. I just found out today that the um, PhD program in quantitative biomedical sciences, Jason Moore, congratulations, was, was, uh, was approved. That's uh, a big step forward. So I want to acknowledge uh, Duane and Alan for their excellent work. And uh, going to talk a little bit about the Williamson Translational Research Building. But first, 
uh, I want to brag a little bit about the great work that the Biomedical Research Council has done in recruitment. Uh, we've recruited uh, 21 um, new researchers, um, most of them basic science researchers, but five or six physician scientists. The latest um, being right here, um, Robert Kramer is, uh, I think Bill Green just signed Robert yesterday. He's uh, an outstanding uh, microbiologist from Montana State who is well-funded, and uh, Bill, I hope I have that right, and is coming to, uh, to join us uh, uh, this summer. You can see the funding that these people are bringing. Uh, it's quite substantial, um, so we're attracting talented people, and the last time I looked at the numbers, on average, people will bring in a half a million dollars per recruit per year. So this uh, is, uh, is a testimony to um, the excellent work that already exists here and the strong desire of talented people to, to join the ranks. We have new research leadership. Um, Amar Das joined us a month or six weeks ago from Stanford to head up our biomedical informatics uh, program. Chris Amos will join us in August uh, to head up biostatistics, a gigantic recruit from MD Anderson. And we've asked Hal Sox to head the Office of Research Mentoring. Um, this will be a program that will ensure that every uh, investigator, particularly the young investigators, have a mentoring team to work with, uh, opportunities to have their grants reviewed internally in a mock study section before they go uh, go uh, to study section, so I want to acknowledge uh, Hal for uh, his willingness to take this on. The Williamson Translational Research Building is about 160,000 square feet. Uh, I think all of you know uh, uh, where it is uh, going to be located. Um, um, we think this is the best place for it to be located. Um, the the um, open bay laboratory concept you're all familiar with, uh, it gives us the opportunity to co-locate uh, researchers programmatically. So this space will not be allocated to departments. It'll be allocated to, uh, to programs. Uh, and I want to acknowledge Dave Harris. I don't know if Dave's in the room. Um, Dave worked extremely hard to keep this project at budget and, and uh, and create connections between Borwell and Rubin and the new building so as to have uh, the research um, connectivity. So if you see Dave, thank him, and thank uh, Gail Dahlstrom from, from DH as well. This building comes in at about 108 million, and uh, Dave and his team just did wonders to, to, to bring it in at, at budget. Uh, this is what it looks like in cross-section. The top three floors will be wet labs, um, um, the uh, main floor, which at the hospital is the third floor, will be the home for Synergy, um, for biostatistics, biomedical informatics, the clinical trials office, and a few other uh, activities. Third floor will be pathology, a, a need that the hospital's had for quite some time. Um, and we'll have a vivarium in the, in, in the, uh, in the basement or, or the second floor. Um, this is an artist's re rendition of what it'll look like. It probably won't look in exactly like this. This building is also uh, on target and uh, anticipate getting uh, the green light from the board this weekend as, as well. Number three is really uh, being the paradigm for tackling healthcare's toughest challenges. We've got uh, three or four uh, areas of focus here. One is, is we're in the process of aligning our healthcare delivery initiatives across Dartmouth, looking at how does TDI optimally um, relate to uh, TDC, to the medical school, to the hospital, to Tuck, and to Thayer, and, and the arts and sciences for that matter, to really create the premier healthcare delivery uh, initiative uh, in, in, the, in the world. We want to build global health. We've got a good start. I've asked Lisa Adams to serve as our Associate Dean for Global Health. Uh, I think some of you know Lisa will be going to Rwanda this summer for 
for uh, six months. So that probably won't get uh, geared up till the first of the year, but we don't want to stand still. So again, I uh, want to thank Lisa for, for her willingness to take that on. And then uh, to help with the alignment with Dartmouth-Hitchcock, we've recently recruited Greg Meyer from Mass General. Uh, Greg is uh, executive vice president at the hospital, but I've also um, asked him to serve as senior associate dean for clinical affairs in the medical school to help uh, you know, build that uh, uh, bridge. And of course, we'll continue to, to build on the superb work that, uh, that Jack Wimberg started uh, some 40 years ago. Uh, connecting hearts and minds is critical. Um, I think we do it well. I think there's opportunities to uh, do it better. Uh, very proud that 11 of our students this year were awarded uh, Schweitzer Fellowships. I have to give Joe Donald some credit for nurturing that along. I think the Proudy, um, under Mark Israel's leadership, continues to be um, uh, as good of an outward expression that we have in the community. And I know Mark is on target this year to raise, uh, hopefully, in the two and a half million dollar range that will be terrific for supporting uh, cancer uh, research. Uh, many of you know uh, former Dean Jim Strickler, who's shown on the bottom left here with President Yayaga from Kosovo receiving uh, an award from, from her for his uh, outstanding uh, service uh, to, that, to that country. And I was, uh, I was very pleased to see that more than four-fifths of our students uh, participate in one or more community service projects. <laughs> this is entirely voluntary, but it's clear that it's part of the of the ethos uh, at the medical school. I want to acknowledge a couple of people who, um, who I think do, uh, are, are really uh, uh, st stepping up. Um, um, Gil Welch is a professor uh, in, uh, in TDI, one of, our, one of our best teachers. But I, I don't know of anybody um, uh, at Dartmouth, and I really don't know of anybody in the country who who writes more op-eds on healthcare than Gil. And you know, these are not in, just in the Valley News. They're in the New York Times, and here's one in the uh, LA Times from, from a month ago. Uh, this gives us great visibility nationally. And uh, so I wanted to uh, acknowledge uh, Professor Welch. Um, in terms of quality care, uh, I see it, uh, us as uh, as good a place in the country for end of life care, and if you haven't read Ira's book, which came out a couple months ago, that's called the best care possible. It's uh, really one one passionate man's uh, insight into this just critically important aspect of of what we do. I've talked to Ira a bit about incorporating some of the fundamentals into the education of the, of the medical students and uh, very excited about, uh, uh, about uh, that prospect. So we've got some ambitious goals and uh, you know, no talk would be complete without a few numbers. Um, uh, I want to, we, we have to pay attention to the, to the numbers and uh, um, uh, here, are, here are the goals that we've set for ourselves for, for 2020. As you can see there in the top right row, right now we have about $20 million in central reserves in the medical school. That may sound like a lot, but you know, there's $80 million out in the departments. Chairs, don't worry, we're not going to come, come after it. Um, but we want to get that up to $30 million. Our endowment value is, uh, is about just over $400 million, it may be under that given what's happened in the past month, but Mark Notstein, who many of you have met, has a, has a terrific plan in place to, uh, to get that up to 600 million. You know, I would certainly like to leave the medical school in, in good hands uh, when I'm done, and I think a $600 million endowment is, is, is a pretty decent force. Uh, currently, we raise just under 
four million in current use gifts, that's cash gifts that are largely unrestricted. We want to double that. You can see we're on target with our recruits. Uh, we didn't talk about mega grants. These are these big, greater than a million dollar a year grants. Um, we need to double our mega grants, and I think we're on track uh, uh, to do that. And then finally, our reputational scores, and I, I, know it's just, I, I know it's just a survey, but we have to pay attention to our reputational scores, and, and one of the best ways to increase them is to tell our story. And I think a number of you have, a number of you have had a chance to work with, uh, with Gary and Derek, and they created the video, by the way, and you've experienced just the superb work that's going on in the, on the communication marketing side. So I want to acknowledge them. So the goals are lofty. Uh, I, you wouldn't want it any other way. Um, they're aspirational, and the bar is high. Um, but I think we're up to the challenge. And uh, I, think, I think we're up to the challenge for you know, a number of reasons. We, we've got good support from the, from the college and the board. Uh, when Jim Kim uh, announced that he was leaving, the board chair called me and said, you know, you, the, the school is going to continue to be supported. But I think the most fundamental reason that I'm optimistic um, is, is because of our people. And I think our people are, by far and away, our most important asset. And uh, if we're going to pull this off, and by the way, we're only going to do it together. I, I'm certainly not going to do it. Uh, we'll, we'll do it together. We've, uh, we've got we've to have lots of confidence in our people. And so what I'd like to do is just uh, recognize a few individuals who don't always get recognized, and, uh, but they uh, step up every day and uh, they live out our values and uh, uh, you know at the end of the day these, these are people that um, that um, kind of make it happen so um, I don't know that I've met John Rader but but uh, everybody tells me about John in fact he's been described as the MacGyver of the medical school <laughs> and uh, John can fix anything with uh, a Swiss army knife and duct tape so that's quite, thank you, John, uh, for your great work. Um, Robert, don't call me Bob Maui, is, uh, is one of our uh, professors in neuroscience and uh, had, had the opportunity to work quite a bit with, with uh, Maui, as he likes to be called. And, uh, you know, this guy does everything. I mean, he teaches medical students, graduate students, undergraduates. He's part of the Embry grant that Ron Taylor has uh, in terms of nursing education, um, has been very active in, in, in curricular reform and uh, just, uh, uh, you know, want to um, thank him for his contributions. The students certainly know Colleen King. Colleen heads our anatomical yeah. gifts program, which is the program that uh, manages the, in a, in, a, in a wonderful way with dignity and integrity, the use of the cadavers that the students uh, learn on. Um, the other thing about Colleen, which uh, is uh, I need to learn more about, is she she manages the what is it the March Madness pool <laughs> for betting on the on the basketball. Um, Mary Jo Turk I put up there because uh, she was described as being on fire, and Mary Jo's uh, really on a roll. He's gotten three very prestigious grants this year, and including a perfect 10 on her NIH uh, uh, submission. How often does that happen? And then Linda Martin, many of you know Linda in, uh, in medical education, uh, has been there for many decades, always welcoming students, always making them feel at home, kind of the den mother of our students and uh, uh, just irreplaceable. We've got three students that uh, uh, I wish I could honor all 330 of them. Uh, Valerie Jacobs is president of the student body and has just been a terrific leader uh, in her class. So Jessica has been extremely involved in, uh, in curriculum reform and um, uh, uh, as you saw she was highlighted in, in the video and it was Laura who was recently uh, elected to the uh, LCME board which as you know is the um, 
accrediting body for medical school accreditation. Now, you're probably sick of me talking about the LCME. I'm not saying that Laura's going to help us on that site visit, but um, I'm going to ask her to. She, uh, Laura is currently a Hughes Fellow uh, down in Boston and another very active person um, with curricular form, and she drives up or takes the Dartmouth coach to Hanover to participate in those meetings. That's, that's really quite remarkable. So um, I guess it's 215 years that we've been uh, at it. And uh, I think in the history of the medical school, the one thing that is uh, constant, um, evergreen, if you will, is the presence of outstanding educators. And uh, from the time of Nathan Smith to the recent naming of the medical school, um, you know, the educators here really form the backbone of the school. You know, I've, I've read um, about the founding of the medical school, and, and Nathan Smith, in the, uh, uh, when he founded the school in 1797, would, would go on horseback all over New Hampshire and Vermont seeing patients, and he'd take students with him. Um, and was really recognized at that period of time as the premier medical educator uh, in, in the country. So we want to preserve that, um, that tradition. So um, I'm really excited that tonight, in a few minutes, for the first time in the history of the school, we're going to uh, establish an academy of master faculty educators. Um, this, was, this was a difficult process because there are so many people who who we should, who, who could be recognized. But uh, after talking to many people and inviting nominations, and uh, we've come up with 16, there will be more next year, and there will be more the year after that. But these people, and I, I don't think you'll be surprised, they represent the pinnacle of teaching excellence. They embody the very best of the Geisel School of Medicine. And, uh, and you know, their peers recognize that. So um, what, uh, the way we're going to do this is, um, and I hope for most of you it's a surprise. We tried to keep it a surprise. If there's one thing I've learned is not everybody keeps surprises. But I, 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 I asked each of, the, each of the honorees to identify a student or a, someone they have worked with that was particularly special for them. And that individual is going to introduce them. And uh, I, if my math is correct, all 16 of them are here. And that's a miracle, given that people travel and, and so on and so forth. So um, what I'd like to say to the people in the front row who will do the introducing, I'm going to sit down. Uh, I don't need to come up 16 times. Please keep your comments to a minute. Introduce yourself. Talk about your, your master educator. Uh, and the master educator, uh, after your name is called, if you would come forward and have a seat up there. We don't have time for you to talk. <laughs> we, we did that math, and we would be here till tomorrow. Um, uh, so um, uh, let's get started. and. Uh, as soon as one student is, is finished, you can sit down, and then the next one comes up, and we'll just keep doing it. So, Molly, we're going to start with you. Good evening. Um, although this is the Academy of Master Faculty Educators, this particular individual additionally truly embraces the role of mentor. A long-standing member of what is really the foundation of this medical school, he has touched so many students. He is the revered head of the incomparable Smith Society, which is how I first came in contact with him, but it was during a first-year elective that I really came to know what a special teacher he was. Mindfulness in Medicine was the title, and as it combined two of my favorite things, I was thrilled to see it on the roster. The material was interesting, but I think the most valuable thing I took from that elective was a role model. 
I saw someone whose ability to connect with his students and his patients was unparalleled. And after a number of likely overly enthusiastic emails, I actually had the privilege of co-teaching the elective with him during my third and fourth years. I don't think I expressed this enough to him at the time, but teaching alongside him was one of my greatest honors in medical school. He is a cornerstone of this school and a real gift to its students. And with his legendary final lecture, he has likely turned a disproportionate number of them into cardiologists. So please join me in honoring Dr. Jim Bell. I am truly honored to have the opportunity to introduce such an incredible mentor and teacher. He arrived at Dartmouth in 1993 and has been involved in medical and graduate education since then. He has participated and served as core course director for several years for both biomedical and genetics basis of medicine course taken by the first year med students as well as first year as a part of first year MCB core course. In 2004 he was awarded the distinguished lecture award by the first year medical students also winning the Graduate Faculty Mentoring Award in 2007. So far, he's graduated 12 PhD students from his lab and will hopefully be adding more to that list soon. Um, throughout my years in his lab, I've come to realize that he has an incredible way of tailoring his teaching techniques to each individual. He learns from our strengths and weaknesses and uses that to teach us individually, um, which not only makes him an incredible teacher, but also uh, but also gives each student a unique view on how great he is. He's taught some of us how to do cesium chloride preps and western blots, and others just how to have more confidence in themselves. He's listened to us sometimes practice our talks for hours on end until we finally feel ready. He's helped us build new roads when we think our projects are completely at a dead end. For me, it's the fact that no matter how early I am in lab, I know he's always there with his door open, waiting to hear what I have to say whether it's talking about science, data, or just something I need help with. He's taught me the value of a great experiment and that patience isn't just a virtue. It's actually a necessity, especially in science. He's taught me, and although there's, he's taught us all in different ways, he's taught us to be better scientists and better individuals. So please join me in honoring Dr. Dwayne Compton. I'm Molly, by the way, I forgot the first time. So I came back again. <laughs> so I'm also very honored to have been asked to introduce one of the most special educators we have here at Geisel. It's so rare and wonderful to come across a teacher with an obvious passion, commitment, and expertise in both the fields of medicine and education. Any student who has had the privilege of working with her instantly feels cared about and invested in, which is truly a gift in a world where you are often mistaken for some inanimate room decor. She inspires and is respected by all who are fortunate enough to work with her, including myself. I was recently at a conference with her where she humbly accepted a major award for her work in creating online learning modules, which are now almost uniformly used in US medical schools. We were in a seminar together and started talking about the neuropsychology of information processing, really, um, and ran out of time mid-conversation. She said, we should finish this conversation, which I sort of interpreted as just a polite way to say, I don't want to be late for the keynote address. But almost as soon as I landed in Boston, I found myself sitting in a restaurant with her, and we really finished the conversation. This is the sort of unsolicited commitment and genuine enthusiasm that she brings as a teacher, colleague, and mentor. I'm just one of the many students who's been truly inspired by her, and so it is my great pleasure to help honor Dr. Leslie Fall. My name is Brian Pfeiffer. I'm honored to have been asked to introduce also another wonderful educator and mentor. When I first arrived at this school just shy of a year ago, I was immediately impressed with this faculty member's special gift to teach for understanding. Apparently, I wasn't the only one that recognized it either, because it seemed as if 
at every lecture there was a sold out crowd. Um, students realized that they weren't being talked at or talked to, but truly taught. She epitomizes masterful teaching. As time went on, my peers and I realized that this faculty member is not only a master teacher, but she has a gift for giving sound and trusted advice and great encouragement. Uh, one time in my young medical career, I was a little bit down and out, and it was the winter time, and I took a, uh, a set of exams, and I was incredibly distracted. In fact, I'd already set up an appointment to talk about possibly uh, deferring enrollment for a time to, uh, to consider other options, and I, uh, I did quite poorly on these exams for anybody's standards, and, uh, and especially mine. And I came into class the next day, and I walked past this faculty member, and, and there was a very distinct look at me. And, uh, and I looked at her, and I said, you saw my grades, didn't you? And she smiled and said, yeah, do we need to talk? Uh, and we did. And, uh, and she snapped me back quickly uh, to where I needed to be. Uh, she gives great advice. Her name is often heard in the hallways and classrooms around campus as a figure to whom students look for direction and support. She has become a champion for her students and has lifted the bar for the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. Please join me in honoring Dr. Virginia Lyons. I'm Amy Thomas, I'm third year here at Dartmouth, and uh, have been blessed to have worked with uh, the person that I'm going to be um, talking about um, across the three years of being here. Uh, the first two in the classroom and the third he probably doesn't know about, but I was uh, lucky enough to be able to see a few of his write-ups about patients while I was out in family medicine and uh, really enjoyed his wisdom in uh, guiding me with uh, handling those patients. Um, in the first year, my first memory of this person was um, of going to the hospital and being able to see him um, give a special uh, lecture. And I remember being so excited because um, he was teaching um, a physiology concept that I just hadn't gotten at all and had tried to read chapters and tried to go through my notes and all of a sudden a light bulb went off when I had him and I went up to him afterwards um, and said, where have you been all this time? You know, you finally made this make sense to me. Why aren't you, you know, in more of my classes? And he said, well, I'm glad it made sense. Just wait till second year, you'll see a lot of me. And uh, he was absolutely right. He led all of the pulmonology lectures, um, or a vast majority of them, in second year. And uh, I was also blessed to be in a small group and felt like I'd won the lottery and being able to be one of the students that got him both in class and outside of class. Um, so I'm honored to be able to um, be here to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Manning into the Academy. Thank you. I'm Eddie Rulin, a fourth year uh, MD, MBA student. And I too am honored to introduce a, to a truly great teacher. And I'm excited for this new uh, master educator. Uh, he, this professor has a long track record in great teaching. Not only did I attend his lectures in the first two years, but just a few short years ago, my father attended the first two years under this professor. He's a teacher I've gotten to know inside and outside the classroom. And through this, I've seen that he truly cares about students and getting to know them outside the classroom. He embodies what makes Dartmouth special and why I chose to come to this great institution. I believe that nominating him will continue to bring a future of great students to this university as well. Please join me in honoring Dr. Jean Natty.
My name is Carolyn Cloris, and I'm a third year medical student. I'll be introducing one of the first physicians that my class met when we came to Dartmouth, and it turns out one of our most dedicated educators, although we didn't, didn't know that about him yet. I had the opportunity to get to know this physician as a lecturer, a PBL tutor, and on, as a leader in the medical education committee where we not infrequently disagreed, but he was always happy to, to hear my opinion and those of other students, which we really appreciate. I was actually pretty intimidated to find out that he was my PBL tutor as he wrote most of the cases. But uh, on our first day, or, or maybe our second session, he brought out his Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. It really loosened us up. By the end of the month, we were all acting out the cases, and PBL turned out to be one of the best parts of Dartmouth for me. So uh, please join me in recognizing this educator for his dedication and also his sense of humor. It's Dave Nurnberg. It is a tremendous opportunity uh, to, uh, in, in, in honor and a uh, privilege to speak about this master educator. Um, he is a tremendous role model, an inspiring teacher, a caring mentor, and someone who, I'm, who I consider to be the treasure of Kaizel. Joe's, excuse me, <laughs> Joe's humanistic focus has forever changed my relationship to medical training and practice. Through his words and actions, he has helped me transform challenging moments of medical school into opportunities for growth and learning. He has counseled me through personal and professional challenges that I have faced. In addition to these important moments requiring his advice and wisdom, Joe asked me about my daily life too. He is one of the most genuine, honest, wise, and trustworthy people I have ever had the privilege to know. He is well known for his heavy sprinkling of inspirational Quotes emphasize his points. There's one quote he related from the philosopher scientist Albert Schweitzer that has stuck with me. Uh, it sums up, I think, the gospel of Joe. Grow into your ideals so that life can never rob you of them. He has done so and makes us believe that we too may be so lucky. Joe is a major reason why the school is what it is, a thriving and mutually supportive community. Be it in his office, one-on-one, -on -one, in the classroom, during a lecture or discussion, or in his weekly community-wide emails, he creates an open, caring space in which to speak freely about challenges, but also to share joys and accomplishments. He creates a sense of shared responsibility to each other. So Joe is a major reason why medical school education has been positive, exciting, and inspiring. Time and again, he's helped me find ways to rediscover the satisfaction and meaning of medical training when it was obscured by stress or pressure. While the curriculum and the knowledge required to be a physician may be dictated by years of science and clinical practice, the hidden curriculum is much more flexible and is shaped in large part by the attitudes and ideals of those within the learning community. Joe's greatest impact has been on molding the hidden curriculum into one that allows students to grow into their ideals so that nobody can ever rob them of them. Congratulations. I'm Ed Marins. I'm a class of Geisel class of 1994. Back then, we called it Dartmouth Medical School. I'm proud to be part of Geisel now, um, and it's really an honor to be here. Um, unlike my uh, presentees that preceded me, I've been here for a little bit longer, and and uh, this is truly an honor to come back at, at, at this event. Um, I also feel like I'm a current student. I'm in the Master's in Healthcare Delivery Science course, so I get the student discount when I go to places in town, which is. <laughs> 
really nice. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased to announce this uh, master clinician and someone I've known for two decades. Um, I've known this person as a student. I've known them as a, in the classroom, in the hospital. I've known them uh, as my attending, as someone I've dealt with patients that are in clinic, in the hospital, patients that are doing well and patients that are not. Um, this is someone that I've worked with on programmatic design and in many ways we've been conspirators in developing things that were the best things for teaching and the best things for, for patients. Um, he's had a storied career as a pulmonologist. He's developed one of the region's most profound and well-recognized programs for the care of patients with cystic fibrosis, but continues to partner with in other areas and advance the knowledge and especially the training of the people that provide that care. He's been dedicated as a leader of GME, um, and he's really at his best when he's a teacher, when he emerges from the room in his yellow gown, um, and in his aw shucks, hands open wide way, wants to talk with you about the case. And it is an honor for me uh, to look back over the years that I've been blessed to, to be in its midst uh, and have this opportunity to honor uh, Worth Parker as a master clinician. I'm Kathy Kirkland, and I'm a class, a member of the Dartmouth Medical School class of 1986. So I have you beat, um, Ed, by about a decade. And it's an incredible honor to be here, especially in that I have the privilege of introducing someone who's served as an inspiration for literally generations of uh, people like me, especially those who have gone into infectious disease and microbiology. Uh, I was told I only have a minute and I will keep to that, but I just wanna highlight um, three things that I realized as I was reflecting on the impact that this person has had on me and my career um, that stood out for me. First is the incredible power of story to illuminate science. And I will never walk by the Hanover Inn without thinking of the Hanover matron who looked down at a tea that she was attending to see an Ascaris crawling down her leg. <laughs> Secondly, and this was a really important part of my learning that helped me both as an infectious disease physician and a parent, and I think have hel has helped many of you and probably inspired my focus on hand hygiene, and that is the understanding of the fine fecal veneer that covers the world <laughs> that I learned about from this teacher, this master teacher. And in fact, when I used to give the gastrointestinal diseases lecture for the SBM ID course, it was a series of stories about fecal veneer, which I titled, Food and Feces, a Bad but Inevitable Combination. <laughs> Finally, I think, as I look back on the impact of this teacher, was the incredible respect that he demonstrated for students, and that really informs me as I try to develop myself into a master teacher in his footsteps. The punctuality with which he began and ended every lecture, the incredible amount of preparation that he put into each lecture, rehearsing it numerous times, and yet sounding fresh and entertaining each time is an inspiration to me. And I realized looking back on that, that those were marks of an incredible respect for the human beings that he was teaching. So it is my incredible honor to introduce Elmer Pfefferkorn as
I think that's going to be pretty tough to top. <laughs> My name is Tom Finn. I'm a fifth year uh, MD MBA student graduating in less than a week now. Very exciting. Um, I'm honored to have been asked to introduce this master educator. Sorry, my notes are on my iPhone, I just have to refresh it. Um, this particular faculty member has meant a great deal to me and my classmates due to her undying commitment to both education and the well-being of her students. I first met her during my first year on doctoring course. And from my very first small group meeting, she managed to make each of the eight stressed first year uh, medical students forget about the homework and studying and the stress during a one hour together as we sat captivated by her boundless knowledge and expert advice. As each of us progressed through our four years, or in my case five, at Dartmouth, she has evolved from teacher to mentor to friend. And I'm confident that the majority of students at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth feel exactly the same way, as evidenced by her perennial receipt of teaching and mentorship awards. Through her role in internal medicine and geriatric clerkships, as well as leadership, in both the Hanover, Hanover and Lebanon campuses of the Geisel School of Medicine. She has touched the lives of many Geisel students and has of course played no small role in many students' decision to pursue a career in internal medicine, including my own. <clears throat> it is clear to me and to my classmates that she is extremely worthy of this distinction today and it is my hope that this honor will only help to expand her influence and mentorship of Geisel students for many years to come. Please join me and welcoming Dr. Roshni Pinto Powell. Hi, my name is Kent Powell. As a 2007 graduate of what was DMS, now Geisel, um, and a current faculty member at DHMC Lyme, uh, I am uh, honored to be asked to introduce somebody who has had a major impact in my professional career. I came to Dartmouth almost certain that I was going into emergency medicine. That is until my third year family medicine clerkship and that's where I worked with this person, not only in her role as a clerkship director, but as a mentor and a clinical preceptor. And that's where I found my passion for primary care. The lessons that I learned from her, including taking care of the whole patient and not just the disease, I carry with me and I, and I honestly use them every day in my, in my practice. I can truly say that I'm a, I'm a better clinician for having known this individual. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kathy Pipus. Hello, uh, I'm Steve Benson, class or Dartmouth Medical School Geisel class of 1990. It is uh, a great honor to introduce this faculty member who has had such a profound influence on me personally, as well as so many, medical, so many other medical students, house staff, fellows, and colleagues. He truly embodies the ideal of a medical scholar, teacher, and mentor. My first exposure to him was a second year medical student. The energy in his classroom, the humor, and the knowledge that he conveyed was infectious. When I am asked by my students or patients, why did you choose gastroenterology, why? I answer that for me it was not a burning interest in gastrointestinal order, disorders, <laughs> but rather my exposure to him and a few of his buddies during my formulative medical school years that steered me towards my life's work. Well, today, I run the SBM course in which I first encountered him, and I witness each year the same reaction, the same reception from the Geisel students of today that I had so many years ago. Each year, I review the student evaluations, and year after year, the enthusiastic and laudatory comments are the same. Year in and year out, he is our top-ranked faculty member of this undergraduate medical school course. What makes him so unique, however, is the breadth of his influence at so many different levels indeed all levels of medical education. My own experience with him reflects that. I've been fortunate enough to work with him as a medical student, as an intern, a resident, 
chief medical resident, fellow, GI fellow, um, and today as a faculty member, I continue to seek his advice and look on him as a lifelong mentor and role model. He has had a profound impact at each level of my training at all the critical junctures in my life, just as he has had for so many other students and mentees. Whether it is discussing a research project, giving career advice, explaining the pathophysiology of achalasia, or demonstrating how to take an effective history and physical exam, he's able to effectively instruct, encourage, and to cheer you along in the learning process. From the bedside, to the undergraduate classroom, to the AGA National Meetings plenary lecture before 5,000 GI colleagues, he's able to teach effectively, communicate to, and to, as he likes to say, entertain his audience. But what I think really makes him so effective in so many different learning environments is the unbridled and childlike enthusiasm that he exudes. He loves what he is doing, and he loves teaching. And we all love to be around him and learn from him because of it. One day we were busily working in the, in the uh, endoscopy suite on a particularly challenging case, and there were several of us involved. And right in the middle of it, he pauses, and with a big smile on his face, he says, can you believe they pay us to do this? <laughs> <clears throat> I speak on behalf of the countless students, house staff, and colleagues that he has inspired during our medical education. We appreciate all that you have given through every facet of your life. It has been a privilege to learn from you and to work with you, and this award is so well deserved. Thank you for all you've done, Dr. Richard Rothstein. I'm Christina Megley. I'm a seventh year MD PhD student. Um, and it is my pleasure to uh, be introducing and honoring this person who has had a profound influence on my life. I first met this individual when I interviewed, and I found him behind large stacks of paper in old Remsen. He somehow inspired me to move across the United States and come to Dartmouth. And then, through my interactions with him as a first year medical student in medical microbiology, inspired me to switch from cancer pharmacology to microbiology and join his lab. Through my tenure um, in, in this individual's lab, I have witnessed him spending tireless hours on educating students, whether it be the 42, I think I counted, people who ha he has trained in his lab, or through the lectures and the interactions that he has had with students on a daily basis. I have had the privilege of being able to work with him in the medical microbiology lab, coming full circle to where I met this individual, and saw him look over each lecture and preparation whether it was his or from others, and make sure that every year everything was up to date, spending tireless hours on the education of Dartmouth medical students and graduate students. And to put that all in perspective, this person has multiple grants, including a prestigious merit award. He is the PI of the multi-institutional $15 million Enbury grant. He has over 90 publications in prestigious peer-reviewed journals, including PNAS, Nature, and Cell. And he has been a huge inspiration to multiple students. And people from his lab have gone on to work at the NIH, the CDC, and to be faculty at medical schools across this country. Please join me in honoring Dr. Ronald Taylor. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Joseph Tannenbaum, and I'm a 13 at the college, which means I just finished my junior year uh, and will be a senior next year, which is pretty scary. <laughs> um, the uh, master educator that I've been asked to introduce today, I've actually only known for about 10 weeks. Uh, we, he taught a course that I took uh, this spring. And um, at the start of the class, he mentioned uh, that no one in the class would be allowed to use their laptops. Uh, and as a member of Generation Y, this was very scary to me. Uh, I use my laptop for everything, as does everybody else in my class. Uh, but 
the, re the reason that I share that story is because this really speaks to why he is a master educator. When he, uh, when he told us we would not be allowed to use our laptops, he mentioned that anybody in our class uh, who disagreed with him could uh, pursue a research project with him about uh, the impact of uh, laptop use on student performance. And uh, <laughs> being, being the naysayer that I am, uh, I approached him after class and said, you know, I, I disagree. Uh, and I, I have to say, I, I was wrong. Um, <laughs> Uh, th through our, you know, through our research, uh, this uh, this master educator and myself have uh, he's he has spent countless hours uh, working with me and, and editing my tables and abstracts uh, ad nauseum, uh, and he has spent countless time outside of the classroom uh, just mentoring me and giving me suggestions about uh, my future academic career, um, and so it really is uh, an honor, and I want to say thank you very much to this gentleman, uh, but it really is an honor to introduce uh, Gil Welch. Hi, I'm Jean Hamlin. I'm a fourth year student at Dartmouth. I'm honored to introduce a master educator. I have greatly appreciated his creative approach to education. He delights in posing open-ended questions that have more than one right answer. He assigns journal articles and expects students to critique the researchers' conclusions. Questioning authority is not only permitted, it's part of the curriculum. He breaks down boundaries that separate academic disciplines and includes history and art in his medical lectures. He also brings a sense of fun to learning, including a Jeopardy-style endocrinology competition complete with costumes. In addition to his work at the medical school, he teaches undergraduate courses and advises thousands of pre-medical students through the Nathan Smith Society. He's been my teacher since my first term at Dartmouth College at age 18, and I know of no other educator who has been a mentor to so many students. On behalf of all of us, thank you, Dr. Witters. There you have it, the uh, inaugural uh, group of uh, faculty master educators at the Geisel School of Medicine. Let's please give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Congratulations. Now the hour is late, and, uh, and so we will not have any questions. Um, I would like to ask the uh, Master educators, to uh, to wait. We want to we want to take your pictures and uh, for your willingness to participate. We have for everybody a new Geisel School of Medicine mug. You can get it on the way out. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Have a great evening. <laughs>